On the post-apocalyptic road, two men are preparing to set off with their looted supplies. They are the saviors who came out from the hilltop. Little did they know that there were two people hiding in the cargo box behind the car. Jesus, looking at these things that were supposed to belong to their community, used a dagger to cut open the bottom of the box, planning to mess with them a bit. Then Jesus looked outside. Climbing up the car was not for the purpose of causing trouble due to discontent, but to see where the Savior's lair was. Jesus dripped some soy sauce outside as a mark. After a few minutes, Jesus felt the speed of the car slowing down, probably getting close to the Savior's lair, so he shouted to Carl to get ready to jump off. Carl hesitated and asked how to do it. Jesus told him to just jump down. They wouldn't get hurt as the car was moving slowly. They could roll in the direction of the jump and hide to follow the car. Making a trail. We just gotta go now. Okay, show me first. We should bail out. Jesus nodded and skillfully jumped down outside. After rolling a few times, he quickly ran behind nearby obstacles and looked at the car. However, Carl didn't jump off but instead made a farewell gesture to Jesus. Jesus laughed. It turned out he had been played by the boy. Soon, the car's speed had slowed down. And outside, they could see the barricades and zombies, indicating that they had reached their destination, feeling that the car was about to stop. Carl quickly hid and picked up their rifle, he was ready to shoot Negan the moment he appeared. This time, Carl didn't plan to return alive. At this moment, the car came to a halt, and voices of people talking were heard outside. People started coming in and moving things. The man had just picked up the case of wine. Now that he's been spotted, Carl shoots the man. Stay back! Drop your weapons! I only want Negan. He killed my friend. No one else needs to die. Just as he finished speaking, whistling came from a distance. No doubt, Negan had arrived. Still smiling, looking at Carl and praising him for being brave, taking advantage of Carl's attention being diverted, one of Negan's men rushed up to snatch the gun. Though Carl managed to kill another person, he was pinned down by Dwight and had his gun taken away. Daryl, inside, could only watch helplessly. Negan approached Carl and didn't kill him. Instead, he held out his hand ready to pull Carl up. He even invited Carl to visit his territory, as if the deaths of his men moments ago were of little consequence. Carl just stared at Negan, Negan chuckled, saying, you're just like your dad, with those annoying eyes. After a few more seconds and seeing that Carl was unmoved, Negan turned his gaze to Daryl, asking how his work was going, whether it was challenging enough for him, and whether he wanted to try working with only one hand. Carl understood that Negan was using Daryl to threaten him, so he had no choice but to hold Negan's hand. Negan led Carl first to the factory building, below which were all the people at the bottom of the base. They all knelt down when they saw Negan. Negan told the crowd that everyone would get fresh vegetables for dinner today, and that they wouldn't need work credits for it. Happy and grateful voices came from below. Negan is letting Carl know that he's the absolute authority here. Carl didn't envy it but rather felt sympathy for the people below. Next, Negan takes Carl to a house where all the women are his wives, including Dwight's wife, Sherry. They didn't have to work. They just had to look pretty and wait for Negan to call them. Negan didn't avoid Carl's presence and directly kissed Sherry in front of him. Sherry didn't dare to resist, but actively cooperated. I don't know if it was Negan's intention or not, but Dwight came here with Daryl and naturally saw the scene. Dwight's heart is like a knife. But on the surface, he still has to pretend to be cold-blooded and unperturbed. Then, Negan brought Carl to his bedroom and chatted with him for a while. Negan even had Carl remove his eye patch not allowing him to wear it anymore. But Negan, a very perverted guy, makes fun of Carl's injured eye as disgusting, hurting Carl's already broken heart even more. Negan used a baseball bat to force Carl to sing while Negan swung the bat around. Every time Negan swung the bat, Carl's heart fluttered in fear that the next time it would hit him in the head. I must say that Negan was very good at casting shadows on people. After a while, Negan brought Carl back to the hall. There was a man bundled up in the hall who, like Dwight, had been robbed of his wife by Negan. Yesterday they had a secret rendezvous that was discovered by the others. This was a breach of Negan's rules, so he was to receive the branding iron. Negan took the iron and pressed it to the man's face. The hall echoed with screams and the sound of cooling. Everyone couldn't bear to watch the scene. The man ended up passing out from the pain of the burn. Negan approached Daryl and told him to hurry up and clean up, aiming to get Carl to watch the addressing the group. 
Negan declared that the wuss had passed out, but the situation was resolved, and any grudges were settled. The marks on his face would serve as a constant reminder of the importance of abiding by Negan's rules. Negan looks at Carl with a smirk on his face. Negan was very good at portraying himself as scary through other events so that people wouldn't dare touch his rules. Taking Carl back to his room, Negan was contemplating how to deal with him. Carl straightforwardly asked Negan why he didn't kill him, his father, or Daryl, Negan patient with children, especially tough ones like Carl, replied that Daryl would eventually become one of his loyal soldiers. He suggested that Daryl might think he can handle it, but it wouldn't take long for him to submit. As for Rick, he had already started providing offerings to Negan. As for Carl, Negan hadn't finished having fun with him yet. I'm thinking we're different. <clears throat> You're a smart kid. What do you think I should do? You know I can't let you go. So, do I kill you? Iron your face? Chop off your arm? Tell me. What do you think? I think you should jump out the window to save me the trouble of killing you. There is the kid that impressed the hell out of me. I think you're not saying what you're going to do to me because you're not going to do anything. If you knew us, if you knew anything, you would kill us. But you can't. Whew. Maybe you're right. Let's go for a ride, kid. From the beginning, Negan had no intention of killing Carl, so he planned to send him back to his community. Afterward, they set out in two trucks, with Jesus cleverly hiding on the rooftop, preparing to escape. Daryl! You seem worried, so I'm taking the kid home. If you do anything now... Dwight! Daryl needs a timeout. Put him back in his box for a while. Negan is an unpredictable person, and it's hard to know what he's thinking, now he's even voluntarily sending Carl back. Of course, Negan is ready to stop by and collect this week's tribute, except that Jesus on the roof of the car is nowhere to be found. It wasn't long after they left that Daryl was shut in as well. There was a noise coming from the door lock but no one came in. Daryl looked down and saw that someone had slipped a note in with a few words written on it. The message advised him to leave immediately, providing a matchstick and a key which Daryl recognized as belonging to his motorcycle. He suspected that Sherry or Dwight had offered the assistance. Daryl pushed the door, and as expected, it opened. He didn't waste any time and quickly headed down the hallway. While walking, he heard voices arguing around the corner, followed by the sound of food being knocked over. Reacting swiftly, Daryl ducked into the nearest room, likely someone's living space. He checked the bedroom, finding it empty. He changed into fresh clothes and helped himself to some food from a shelf. Knowing he needed all the energy he could get to escape, when it seemed quiet outside, Daryl slipped out again. Now holding a steel pipe for protection, he made his way to where his motorcycle was parked. At that moment, Joey approached, mistaking Daryl for one of their people, and greeted him. Joey was startled when Daryl looked up. Joey quickly raised his hands in surrender and nervously explained that the back exit was over there. He promised not to say anything and claimed he was just trying to survive. Much like Daryl at the moment. In the past, Daryl might have shown some mercy, but after being locked up, he had come to understand that these people were all the same. Please! Jesus had arrived by this time, he was ready to leave when he was on the roof of the car just now. However, when he heard that Daryl was locked up, he decided to investigate. Daryl looked at the body and recognized the gun behind it. It was Rick's revolver, and he was returning it to his best mate. Hey, just about getting by here. Just about getting it all. Jesus also picked up the man's walkie-talkie realizing it would allow them to monitor the group's internal communications for valuable information. What you doing up there? 
You gonna eat that? You know she's pregnant. 